Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict commenced at a time of our choosing. For their own safety, all foreign nationals, including journalists and inspectors, should leave Iraq immediately. Hey, you think you get Saddam? Did you get him yet? <laughs> like he didn't know. And I looked at him, I go, well, it'd be a good Christmas present, wouldn't it? Weapon slung because I'm putting the charge on the door, but I pulled my pistol out and I just stuck it up in his face. And I said in English, basically I had mouth, open the door. And he looked at me and he went. No, it's him, it's Mooselet, it's the golden ticket. And he is spilling his guts. And then one of the team members come back like fish in the freezer to the top. And Saddam loved fish. And I was like, oh, uh oh. -huh. Shortly after that, they uncovered the rug with the rope to the cork plug in the hole, uh, pulled the cork out, saw this looking down on a guy, pulled him out of the hole, and it was Saddam. But I looked at him, I said, it's okay, you'll be dead soon. The month of November, we call it was like whack-a-mole. It was like we get some intel hit here or there, some guy that was connected. I mean, we were all over the country trying to catch Saddam. Uh, it got to the point where it was comical, like where we were laughing about it. You know, we would pre-stage. At this point, they've got fobs established in various points of the country, so we would pre-stage at these fobs do a broad daylight helo assault to an objective. And then that evening we'd get another hit and we'd do a you know, ground-based vehicle in Phil and hit a target in Baghdad. And then we'd fly back to Ramadi and we'd hit a target in Ramadi. It was like one after another after another. 24-hour ops, we were literally exhausted. And then lo and behold, uh, early December, so it was December 12th of 2003, um, we got a hit on a guy uh, came up, it doesn't matter how they figured it out, but signal intelligence, a guy popped up and on a phone and it was a guy that we had been tracking named Mohammed Ibrahim al Muslit. And Muslit is who our intelligence analysts, uh, it's not unlike the Bin Laden story in that there was really one person that had been working the problem set from day one, uh, and they were really the key person for tracking down an individual. Um, we had an intel guy that, that tirelessly poured over information and details and data and background and history and had a pretty good idea of how and where Saddam would be, who would be connected to him, and then had further developed how he was getting information out, giving orders out, whatever, and who was hiding him. And Muslit was the key to this. He was the key courier or messenger, if you will, that probably knew where Saddam was and was responsible for giving Saddam's orders out to, you know, the, the sort of network that was spread around Iraq. Uh, so we called him the golden ticket. <laughs> and so they told us they, that we had a possible for Muslit and it was in Baghdad, um, which we were surprised. It actually wasn't far from uh, where we were based out of our, our mission support site, the house that we lived in at Baghdad in the green zone. And so we rolled out on vehicles um, we hit the initial target. It was a troop plus, so it was three teams plus a team from, from another troop um, that hit the initial target, and it was a dry hole. Like, the moose wasn't there, n nothing of value was there, they didn't know anything. Um, but while we were there, you know, we were dead silent. It wasn't like we blew doors and all that stuff. It was a pretty quiet hit. I think they got, a, they got a hit, another hit, and they narrowed down its location, and it was a couple of blocks away. Um, so we moved. It was a kind of four apartments in one house. So it was two upstairs, two downstairs with a stairwell that ran up the middle and then split. So you had one apartment on the right and one apartment on the left. Um, I ended up being the, the lead team on the apartment on the right. And I was a breacher at the time. And, and another team had the door on the left. Um, I was putting a charge up on the exterior door. It was a dual door. So I had to open the exterior and put a charge in between the two to get them to blow both directions. So I'd open the door, place my charge, 
the team behind me on the other door had done the same and somebody in there had like bumped something and made a noise. So I was on a knee and just put the charge on the door and a guy came to my door and like looked at me and I'm weapon slung cause I'm putting the charge on the door but I pulled my pistol out and I just stuck it up in his face. And I said in English, basically I mouthed, open the door. And he looked at me and he went, and so he opened the door. Um, I basically just rode the door into him as soon as he turned the handle, pushed him against the wall and just held him there as the team made entry behind me. Cleared the room, cleared the first room. I think it had a bathroom and maybe one or two bedrooms off of it. All secure, nothing. You know, no, nobody in the house. <laughs> Progressed to SSE, so we're talking to the guy that I've had, had against the wall, cuffed that dude, they're doing a little battlefield interrogation with him. And the other guys are going through portions of the house and we hear a call from one of the back bedrooms and it's a teammate. He's like, hey, I need, I need a guy. There's somebody under the bed back here. That was a good one. You know, the night before, the night before we had a hit come up in Baghdad and it was like, hey, it's one of Saddam's keepers. And we've been chasing Saddam for a while. Let me back up. Let me back up to Thanksgiving. Prior to Thanksgiving, uh, I get called in by the sergeant major in the talk. And there's some guy in there in civilian clothes with one of those scarves on his neck. You can tell, yo, you're new to Iraq. That's a cool scarf, right? So it's still cool to you. And he's standing there. He's like, hey, Tom, this guy's a uh, secret service from Texas. He's one of President Bush's private security when he's at Texas. Um, the president has, is going to dump his security in D.C. He's going to go to Texas for Thanksgiving, and then they're going to take a secret flight over here. And I want your troop to pull protection at, you know, at Biop, the Baghdad International Airport. It's like, okay, <laughs> all right, uh, what do you want me to do? And so Guy Tony, who took his own life after that, took me out, showed me everything he wanted to do. Then we brought the teams out, or the team guys out, and he's like, hey, uh, what can I tell him? What can I, because he told me not to tell him it was the president until the last second. So I devised this story that it was Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders coming in to entertain the troops. And we got to protect them. I'm like, hell yeah, I'll do that, right? So they were motivated. We went out to the airport. We practiced our vehicle lineups and everything. So we're out there Thanksgiving night. And you could hear the plane coming in, and we're all waiting on the end of the runway. And all of a sudden, you see Air Force One spiraling down. And they all look over, and I'm like, all right, I think now's a good time to tell you who's coming in. It's not the cheerleaders. I know it's going to piss you off, but it's the President of the United States. He's going to come serve some food and talk to the boys. And they were pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but then it, and it picks up and they're like, all right, this is cool. You know, as soon as we're chasing Air Force One down the runway for no reason other than to catch up with it later, you know, and it, like, why don't we just stay down this end of the runway? We get out. I mean, we really didn't have much to do with it. There was a few Secret Service. Condoleezza Rice was there. I mean, she's a little firecracker. Piled him in, drove him over to the mess tent. We followed him over, surrounded him. And then I'm, I'm not his AIC, but I'm close to him, you know. And we're backstage, and he's going to go talk to the troops someone's talking about. And, you know, who loves you the most, blah, 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 building him up. Because I don't think they knew he was there yet, because it was that surprise visit no one ever knew about. And we're standing backstage, and he's like, all right. Hey, you think you get Saddam? Did you get him yet? <laughs> like he didn't know. And I looked at him, I go, well, it'd be a good Christmas present, wouldn't it? Well, Yeah. That'd be real nice, you know? I think I'll go talk to these boys now. And he took off. And when Secret Service leans over and he goes, did you just promise the President of the United States you'd have Saddam by Christmas? And I go, I hope not. I said, I hope I didn't do that. I hope he didn't take it that way. He goes, you don't say anything to the President unless it's a positive sentence. I said, okay. <laughs> okay. Good to know now, you know? So he rolls out and we roll back and, and then move on a few more, well, about a month or so, you know. Baghdad that night, you get a, get a hit coming in. Hey, one of Saddam's handlers, we think, is coming into town, we think. He's going to be at this house, we think. And then maybe we can find out where Saddam is. And we had guys who were L O with, you know, other agencies down the street. And I thought, well, they won't, they'll want to be in on this. So I'll go grab him, bring him back. Um, that was the next day. Never mind. We roll up, plan to do the hit. And as we're rolling in, I see some guy walking down the street. I just noticed, you know, black coat, whatever. Walked down the street and went in another gate. I thought, okay. I logged it in, gate color. I don't know why. Went and hit the house. Really nothing there. I'm like, here we go again. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We call it chasing Ellis, right? Never catching Saddam. And then we started taking fire from like far away at the backside of the house. 
And I thought, why are they, are they trying to draw us in? Uh, why would, you know, why would someone shoot at us with our armored vehicles from that far away? So I said, hey, I sent a team down. I said, there was a guy, went in a gate, told him to call the gate, and, I, and it might have been Chris's team. Chris was on that team, I think. Poured down that street, and I, and I told the story before about they got in, they went in, they cleared the place and found him underneath the bed with a plastic AK, almost killed him. Had they killed him, we wouldn't know where Saddam was, right? But they didn't, so we caught him. But to hear it later, I think somebody met him at the gate and ter- scared the shit out of him, like they were trying to get in the gate and some guy opened the gate and he was standing right there and freaked him out and so I took in and, and then everything else was the same after that. But they pulled him back, brought him to the target. I'm like, all right, never mind, let's roll on back. I didn't even talk to that guy. It was just uneventful, but we brought him back for suspicious reasons. Because, well, he had the toy AK and he almost got smoked. And why would you have a toy AK, and, you know, underneath a mattress in someone else's house? Took him back, sent him to Balad for the other guys to have, have their way with him. And I went to bed. Everybody went to bed halfway through the day now, you know. Hey, 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 we got a Saddam hit. And I go, yeah, yeah, when don't we have a Saddam hit? I'm going to finish sleeping. No, 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 it's a good one. Get up. A guy went, pulled the mattress up and laying underneath the bed on the floor was a guy like this, as flat as he could be, and he had a toy plastic AK-47 laying next to him. A toy? A toy, a kid's toy. Shit, you're not. And so, picked this guy up. He didn't look like the photos we had of Mooselet. Um, we didn't think, we on the ground didn't think it was him. Ah, whatever, it's another one of those dry holes. But they were both a little weird and a little shady, and there was a few things on target that didn't make sense. Um, and one of them was in the SSE, in Mooselet's wallet, he had, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of cash, and it was in U.S. hundreds. The U.S. hundreds were sequential. So the serial numbers on the bills were literally in order. So like wow. 00851, 00852, 00853. You guys figure that out right there on the spot? Yeah, so the the... You don't see that, right? Like, unless it came out of a large sum of money that was withdrawn from an institution at one time, that just doesn't happen. But regardless, like, it didn't look like our guy. We didn't think our was guy. And then we'd been chasing Saddam for a year. So we're like, it's just another dry hole. So we drove the detainees back to Biap, handed them off to our intel analysts and some of the interrogators that had set up shop there at Baghdad International Airport. Uh, and we went home. And like I said, 24 hour ops, you know, at the time it was commonplace to like pop an ambient when you got back from a mission. So you knew you could get three or four hours of sleep before they woke us up to go do the next one. So I think we popped an ambient, maybe had a beer or two, went like up, oh, another dry hole, and we went to bed. About four hours went by, our intel guy comes running back in to the MSS. He comes back to where our troops' rooms are because we were the ones that had just pulled this dude out. And he goes, it's him, man. It's totally him. And we're like, what? Well, you're ridiculous. There's no way it's him. Yeah, no, it's him. It's Mooselet. It's the golden ticket. And he is spilling his guts. He knows where he is. He knows who's with him. You guys need to get your shit on. Get ready. We're going to Decrit. And we're like, all right. So we had a, our, another one of our troops, our recce troop actually was in Decrit. So they stuck Mooselet on a helicopter and buy app. They flew him up to Decrit, handed it off to them. We loaded up in vehicles and started the drive, a couple hour drive up to Tikrit from Baghdad. Uh, they took Mooselet out and did a close target reconnaissance in a couple different areas. Um, and what it was was what our intel analysts thought all, all along. He was going to be near Tikrit, near Samara or whatever the town he grew up in was, that he was going to only have a tight knit group of people around him, that he was going to be near the river because Saddam loved fish like any he, he had a real strict diet and he only ate fish and he had a personal chef and that chef had a family farm and walt always believed that those were going to be the people closest to saddam because he was paranoid and this dude had been with him forever so we identified the cook's house and we identified the cook's farm the house was in town the family farm was outside of town uh, and we came up with a plan um, after those two were pointed out based on the reconnaissance where we were gonna split up as a squadron. My troop was gonna take the house in town. The other troop plus snipers was gonna take the farm. Um, and we did a simultaneous hit on both those uh, places. Um, while we were doing the hit on the house in town, uh, I think the guys finished up on the farm about the same time. Uh, and the call came back from the farm that it was a dry hole, that it wasn't the right place. It wasn't the cook's family, like something was off. Um, but we had cased the chef. 
uh, and he identified himself as Case, although he didn't say he was Saddam's personal chef. Um, battlefield interrogation right there very quickly led to, yep, I'm Case the Cook, I'm Saddam's personal chef, uh, and yeah, he's been hiding out with my family. I want to wake everybody up, but I don't wake anybody up. Let me look at it first before you wake everybody up, you know, start looking at it, planning it. Yeah, he's pointing out this, a house in the crib, this town, a fish farm, he's in a, he's in a bunker, and I'm like, all right, wake the team leaders up, man. Maybe, man, we'll bring them in here. Woke them up. Everybody gets excited. Wake the teams up. Come up with a plan. There's another troop, you know, up in Tikrit. Our area was Baghdad and South and Fallujah and all that. They were Tikrit and up in that area. So as we rolled in to link up with them and link up with the 4th ID, they got to choose which target they would hit because that was their area. So they chose the fish farm, the fish camp on the river. And I'm like, okay, we'll take the house in town because that's probably where he's at, right? Roll in with a fourth ID. They surround the town like it's a normal patrol. We roll in behind them. The other guys are rolling into the fish farm. We blow the door open in this house, and I go in. There's like, I don't know, five or six little babies laying on the right in front of the door on the ground. I'm like, like jumping over babies, and none of them, they're all still asleep. And then there's this 90 year old guy comes stumbling out, put him down on the ground, and then my boss comes in. All right, what's going on? I go, watch your babies. You know, I'm starting moving babies out of the way. And this guy comes out, he's some old, old, old guy. And then one of the team members come back like, fish in the freezer to the top. And Saddam loved fish. And I was like, oh, oh, ho. Oh. So we started inter- at, talking to this guy, not interrogating, talking to this guy, and um, finds out he cooks for Saddam. He's his cook, and he knows where he's at. And he starts having a heart attack like they all do when you're going to roll them up, right? Everyone has a heart attack. Or women start having babies. Like, I don't care what you're doing, you're still going with me, right? And I'm on the on the radio going, hey, listen, I'm going to do a follow-on mission. I'm going to tape or tie this cook to the front of the pander. He's going to point it out, and we're going to go. And they're like, return to base. Like, listen, you don't get it. I'm going to put him up. He's going to point. We're going to drive there. And we're going to get Saddam. He goes, return to base. I was so mad. So mad. I told the guys, you know, I probably cussed him. Hey, he's blowing this whole thing. We're going to ruin it, blah, blah, blah. Roll back to the palace that we were in when we started. Found my boss and I started to chew his ass because I was so mad. And he goes, shut up and come here. So what had happened was Mousselin, in a last-ditch effort to defend Saddam, had pointed out the wrong farm, knowing he was on another one. Um, so after some work and driving the guy out and confirming locations, they realized they were one farm off. Well, luckily, C1 had hit the first farm, total blackout, no charges, no flashbangs, no nothing. They had done it completely silent, so they hadn't spooked anybody. Uh, they shifted over and hit the next farm. Uh, and then, yeah, shortly after that, they uncovered the rug with the rope to the cork plug in the hole, uh, pulled the cork out and saw this, looking down on a guy, pulled him out of the hole, and it was Saddam. No shit. Yeah. Were you surprised he came back alive? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, you know, during that phase of the war, your your marching orders were kill or capture. Um, you had rules of engagement that warranted either one. Um, I think with Saddam, it was understood that, that we weren't bringing him back. Um, that being said, it's a unit operator and we're the good guys. And they pulled the cork out of the hole and there was an unidentified male with his hands over his head. Yeah. The guys aren't gonna put a bullet in him and they certainly weren't gonna pull him out, look at him and put a bullet in him because that's not what we do. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, friends of mine, guys, I saw this is second hand, I'm still in town going, man, I hope this is it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we're like sitting in the vehicle at this point, just waiting on the radio call. And, uh, but yeah, they, they pulled him out of the hole. Holy shit, it's Saddam. Um, and yeah, that, that was kind of it. So they, the radio call came, and uh, I think the squadron commander at the time said, I have a possible for BL number one. Holy shit. I followed him into this room, and it was one of those things where I opened the door and I looked to the left, and I'm like, salt and pepper beard out to here with a leaf in it, and just standing there handcuffed at a plastic table. I'm like, and he shuts the door, and I go, Holy shit. That's him? He goes, yeah. I go, it looks like Dirty Uncle Fester, right? <laughs> he he <laughs> apparently spoke a little English and knew who Fester was or, or just didn't like me and spit on me. He spit on? Yeah. Saddam spit on yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you do? I imagined myself knocking him out, right? 
But I looked at him, I said, it's okay, you'll be dead soon. And I just turned and walked out. And my boss came out behind me and I go, damn, that was it? I mean, that's it? That's it, literally it. And I had this whole plan. Move him, fly him, put him on an aircraft carrier, you know, so no one can come get him. Everything changed. He went on biop, stayed in a house, smelled biop with two tanks right outside of it, you know? And then went on trial. But I remember driving back in the back of the vehicle. Everybody's asleep. I got the sergeant major with me and, and he's talking to me and he's just got a smile on his face. Pretty cool we caught him, huh? He goes, no. I no longer have a retention problem because <laughs> he knew guys were happy. They finally caught somebody. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And then you go home, you go to bed, and the next day someone's, hey, 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 hey. And you know it's not a Saddam hit, but it's next. And that's when it hits you. It doesn't matter, does it? We're all excited we caught Saddam. Hey, we killed bin Laden. Yay. They were both removed from power, really not doing much by the time we got them all anyway. So it's just next. It just never ends. It just keeps going. You're like, so excited, Saddam, Saddam, if we ever caught him, blah, blah, blah. And you catch him, you're like, that's just another dude, isn't it? It's just another dude. And this one's nasty and dirty and living in a hole, you know? Living in a hole in the ground with a lot of money and a lot of cigars. Invincible cigars. <laughs> I got a box of those at home. They're probably dry rotted. Did you see him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a few cool things happen. Like, there's some pictures that exist. There's some pictures that made it out from that. Um, but uh, one of the cool things that happened was we brought him back to Tikrit and we had him in our detention facility there. We had next to the house, the guys were staying in there. And they let us basically all come into the open hall of this house um, when we walked him out to put him on the helo to fly him down to Biap. So there was an opportunity for everybody that was a part of the operation to physically see him and be close to him and understand the significance of the event. And I thought that was a cool call by the leadership. Uh, the pictures that made it out were actually taken by a by a interpreter that worked for a three letter agency. Um, a lot of pictures were taken that day, and the understanding was these are for years and years only, and they don't they're not for public release. But she immediately emailed those to someone, and they ended up finding their way onto the internet. But uh, it's ancient history now, so it doesn't matter. But at the time, it was a big deal. Yeah, I can um, imagine. But yeah, so flew him down to Biop, and and uh, yeah, he he stayed there. Um, it was a different animal than years later with bin Laden, but Saddam sat basically in a prison cell for a year till they hung him after publicly trying him and the whole thing that happened after that. But did you did you feel anything when when they hung him? We, I mean, when they kicked him off what a two or three story thing and Yeah, I mean when they hung him you know, there's an element of wanting to be there. Yeah. Um I mean we per personally witnessed a lot of the horror that that guy was responsible for like we had seen the scars from it we you, you know it was he was a ruthless ruthless dictator and right wrong or indifferent you know as a soldier as a service member you're an extension of u.s foreign policy right and you are there to do what they ask you to do and we were asked to complete a mission and we did and so even years later with all the hindsight on the iraq war I still think that what we did is the right thing, even if the reasons for getting us there weren't necessarily just. He was a horrible, awful person responsible for brutally murdering thousands of people. Do you want to talk about any of the stuff that you saw? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some of my experience. I didn't see anything when I deployed. Uh, I didn't see anything that he had directly caused when I w was in the SEAL teams in Iraq. And it wasn't until actually my last deployment at the agency um, when I got to see just a site where things happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I knew that he had tortured people. I knew he killed and murdered thousands and thousands of people. In my last deployment, I went to uh, De Hook and right around there, there was this compound that he, with these hooks that came out of the walls and he would take pregnant women and hang them on the hook and they would just be hanging there on the wall until until they fucking bled out and died. Yep. Then inside, this is like a, just a square, maybe a rectangle, two or three stories. I actually had pictures of it. And there was like no railing or anything on the top floor. And then directly off the drop off were these huge like concrete blocks. And 
we were with an interpreter and I was like, what are, the, what are these blocks all around for? And he said that <coughs> they would put heads, they would put, you know, uh, a body, right up, lean them over the block, have their head on that concrete block and they would throw cinder blocks off the third story, crush people's heads. And that, you know, I, I saw a lot of traumatic shit, whatever, it's combat, right? I didn't see anything, I never encountered anything like that. And um, just hearing that and being in that, in that fucking place was, made me realize how evil that son of a bitch actually was. When I was interviewing Chris Van Zandt, we took a break and uh, I have one of the original decks of cards, you know, in that cabinet. I think he saw it and he still smokes. You know, he's, we were out back having, oh, having I'm a- Oh, I'm gonna uh, talk to him about that. <laughs> <laughs> we're out back having a chat and um, he had told me, he goes, you know, we got damn near that entire deck of cards every night. And uh, he had said, you know, people ask how many, how many guys we got, you know, during our time over there. And, and uh, I think he thought I could relate to him, but I, I can't. And uh, he just, he's like, I don't even, I have no idea how many yeah. guys we killed over there. I couldn't tell you. And uh, that's a lot of work, man. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.